Okay, so, um, ready for a deep dive. You guys sent in some really interesting writings, and we're going to take a look at them today. They're about Sodom and Gomorrah, and, you know, how that whole biblical story connects to the LGBTQ plus movement today. Yeah, it's uh, kind of fascinating, isn't it? How they take this ancient story and try to use it to, like, frame these really complex contemporary issues, you know? Yeah, like it's some kind of historical mirror they're holding up, right? Trying to show us something. So what exactly are they trying to get across? Well, their main argument seems to be that the Bible straight up condemns homosexuality as a sin. And they point to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as God's judgment, you know? Like mm -hmm. they specifically mention the whole thing. Foundation tried and true With the solid rock beneath your feet There's nothing you can't do Right, they definitely don't shy away from that part of the story. But they also bring up Ezekiel, don't they? Something about Sodom's pride and neglecting the poor. Yeah, Ezekiel 16.4950. I, I think they're trying to show that it wasn't just about sexual immorality, that Sodom had like a whole bunch of sins going on. Okay, so it's more complex than just one thing. Exactly. So like they acknowledge these other sins, but they always circle back to homosexuality like it was the, I don't know, the biggest factor in Sodom's destruction. And they use verses like Leviticus 18.22 as, you know, like their slam dunk proof of God's stance. So it's like there's this whole tapestry of sin, but homosexuality is like the main thread running through it. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. And they don't stop at just the historical interpretation either. They go on to draw a direct line between Sodom and Gomorrah and the LGBTQ plus movement today. They even call it, and I quote, a similar rebellion against God's design. Whoa! Rebellion against God's design. That's a pretty strong statement, don't you think? So are they basically saying that accepting LGBTQ plus identities today is like on the same level as the stuff that got Sodom and Gomorrah wiped out? Well, yeah. I mean, that seems to be the implication, right? Like they see it as a direct parallel. And this is where they get really intense, especially when it comes to kids. They're totally against any kind of teaching about LGBTQ plus stuff, even acceptance. They even bring up Matthew 18.6. Oh, right. The one about the millstone. That's pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, they're basically saying there are like serious spiritual consequences for anyone who uh, leads children astray in their view on this issue. It's a very strong stance, to be sure. So they lay out their interpretation of Sodom and Gomorrah, connect it to the present day, and come down pretty hard on teaching kids about LGBTQ plus identities. Where do they go from there? Well, it's interesting because it's not all like doom and gloom. Hmm. They do talk about redemption, even for those who, um, you know, have engaged in homosexual acts. Okay, so there's a glimmer of hope. Tell me more about this redemption angle. Well, they believe that through faith in Jesus Christ, there's a path to transformation and forgiveness. They use the example of the Corinthian church in the New Testament. Right, right. I've heard of that. Weren't there people in that church who had, like, all sorts of past before they converted, including uh, homosexuality? Exactly. They point out that even those early Christians, some of whom used to engage in homosexual behavior, were washed, sanctified, and justified when they accepted Christ. It's like all that past stuff gets wiped away, a complete fresh start. <laughs> but do they give specific examples from the Bible to back that up? They do. They point to 1 Corinthians 6.9.11, which lists all these sins, including homosexuality. And then it says, and such were some of you. So it's like they're saying, look. People can change. Your past doesn't have to define you. So we've got this idea that people can change, that transformation is possible. But it's tricky, right? I mean, how do they square that with, you know, still saying homosexuality is a sin? It feels like walking a tightrope, theologically speaking. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's really at the heart of it, isn't it? This tension in their writing, trying to balance traditional beliefs with, well, with grace and compassion for those who are, you know, living differently. It's that whole thing, love the sinner, hate the sin. But can you really separate the two? I mean, how do these writings try to do that? They admit it's tough, but they seem to think it's possible, ultimately. Like, they stress responding to LGBTQ plus folks, not with judgment, but with, and I'm quoting here, love and truth. 
They actually pull from Ephesians 4.15, something mm -hmm. about speaking the truth in love. So it's about being true to your beliefs, but still being kind and respectful. Yeah, exactly. And for them, that comes from a place of caring. I think this belief that everyone, regardless of what they do, deserves love and a shot at redemption. They talk a lot about prayer, too. Like, they urge people to pray for those who identify as LGBTQ plus Y, asking God to, you know, set them on what they see as the right path. So trying to walk that line, holding on to their interpretation of the Bible while still seeing the humanity of folks who see things differently. Totally. And that's where it gets really interesting, I think, because they're grappling with stuff that so many people struggle with today, right? Yeah. Like, how do you balance these deeply held beliefs with the fact that more and more people are accepting diverse lifestyles? How do you even talk about it without, you know, getting angry or judgmental. It's happening everywhere, right? Families, communities, even within churches. And these writings clearly land on the side of like sticking with the traditional definition of marriage and sexuality from the Bible, but they still want people to be compassionate. Right. And it's important to remember there's a whole spectrum of views within Christianity on all of this. These writings are just one perspective, one that really focuses on the power of faith to change people. They seem to believe that if you truly accept Christ, it should radically change your life, including moving away from what they consider sinful behavior. So it's not enough to just say you believe you got to walk the walk, too. Exactly. They're big on personal transformation. They use words like washed clean, made new, walking in the light. It's like shedding your old self, the one who did those things they consider sins, and becoming someone completely new through faith, through living by those biblical principles. It's a powerful image, this whole idea of being remade. Wow. But what about people who say, hey, this is who I am. This is how I was created. Like, what if change isn't the goal? How do they deal with that? That's where you run into some of the limitations of this viewpoint, I think. Yeah. They're pretty set on the idea that anything outside of what they see as God's plan for sexuality is a sin and it needs to be repented of. So not much wiggle room there for different interpretations or a more, I don't know, nuanced view of sexuality? Not really, no. They see the Bible as the ultimate truth on this, and they're sticking to a pretty literal reading of it. But even with that, they, they do seem to be pushing for a kinder, more understanding approach than you sometimes see, even within their own you know, circles. It's like they're saying, we might not agree with your choices, but we still see you as a person. We still value you, and we think there's a way back for you. Yeah, and that's important to get, right? They aren't condoning the behavior, but they are offering grace to the person. And they want their readers to do the same. It's a lot to process, that's for sure. This unwavering belief that it's a sin, but also this focus on love and the potential for change through faith. It's a tricky balance, wouldn't you say? Conviction and grace all mixed up together. Absolutely. And it's a dance a lot of people of faith are trying to figure out, especially now with all these conversations about sexuality and gender always evolving. It really yeah. is a delicate dance, you know? And it struck me as we were talking about all this, how much emphasis they put on this idea of transformation. Yeah. Like it's not just about, oh, I recognize this is a sin. It's about actually turning away from it, becoming different. Yeah, that washed clean imagery, right? Yeah. They keep coming back to that. It's like they're saying real faith should change you from the inside out. And yeah, that includes how you approach sexuality. Exactly. And they tie that directly to the heart of Christianity, don't they? They're saying that when you embrace Christ, it's not just, okay, you're forgiven. It's like you're made brand new. The old you the one who did those things they see as sinful, that person's gone. So for them, there's this expectation of a clean break from the past. If you're truly saved, you're a new creation. And that new you lines up with, you know, how they interpret the Bible's teachings on sexuality. That's it. Yeah. And they believe that that applies across the board, no matter what your past looks like. They say everyone in the church is a former sinner. Yeah. Like we've all messed up. We've all fallen short somewhere. So it's about recognizing that everyone's on their own journey, right? Everyone's got their own struggles. Yeah. And nobody's beyond redemption. Exactly. And that's a big part of their whole argument, this idea that everyone sins. They use it to say, look, yeah, we believe homosexuality is a sin, but it's not like it's special in that way. Everyone, gay or straight, needs God's grace. Interesting. So they're trying to build this sense of shared humanity, you know, even while taking a stance on sexuality that some folks might find, well, divisive to say the least. Yeah, and that's where I think it gets, you know, kind of complicated. Yeah. Because for some people, that message of redemption might click, 
But for others, the idea that you have to basically change who you are at your core, that might be a tougher pill to swallow. That tension again, right. How do you balance those really strong beliefs with compassion for folks who just see things differently, especially about something as personal as as who you are, how you love? It's a question a lot of people are wrestling with, both inside and outside the church. Big time. Yeah. And these writings show just how how layered those conversations can be. There's no easy answers, no one-size-fits-all solution. So where does that leave us then? We've taken this deep dive into Sodom and Gomorrah, all these different interpretations, the, the calls for both condemnation and for compassion. What do we take away from all this? Well, if nothing else, I think it reminds us that we got to have these conversations, even when they're tough. Yeah. And we got to do it with respect, you know, acknowledging that people have different views. Even though these writers take a controversial stance, yeah. they do stress that love and grace thing even when you disagree with someone. Yeah, that's a good thing to remember, especially these days when it seems like everyone's just yelling at each other. For sure. And beyond that, I think this deep dive has shown us that even within Christianity, there are all sorts of different ways of looking at this. These writings present one view, but it's not the only one out there. So it's more of a spectrum, really, not just one big Christian stance on these issues. Exactly. And, you know, when it comes down to it, maybe the biggest takeaway is just that it's okay to sit with the not knowing, with the fact that this is complicated, mm -hmm. to think about these questions, explore the different sides. That's often how we learn, not just about these issues, but about ourselves and what we believe too. Embracing the journey, even when it's messy. Exactly. And who knows, maybe something we talked about today sparked a thought for you, made you want to learn more. That's what we hope for. So keep those minds open, keep asking questions. And until next time, remember, there's always more to discover. Absolutely. We'll leave it right there. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive, everyone. There was a man who built his house upon the shifting sand With walls so tall and windows wide, it seems so fine and grand But when the storm clouds gathered and the winds began to roar his house could not withstand the waves and crumble to the shore. Build your life on the solid rock where the storms cannot prevail. When the rains come pouring down and the winds begin to wail. For the rock is strong and steady, a foundation tried and true. With the solid rock beneath your feet, there's nothing you can't do. Another man with humble heart chose wisely where to build. He dug down deep to the bedrock firm where his soul could be fulfilled. He laid each stone with care and prayer and trusted in the Lord. So when the floods came rushing in, his house stood firm restored. Build your life on the solid rock, where the storms cannot prevail. When the rains come pouring down, and the winds begin to wail. For the rock is strong and steady, a foundation tried and true. With the solid rock beneath your feet, there's nothing you can't do. When the trials of life surround you and the earth beneath you shakes, remember the foundation and no storm can ever break. It's the rock of faith, the cornerstone where hope will always rise. And in the shelter of his love, you'll find peace that never dies. Build your life on the solid rock, where the storms cannot prevail. When the rains come pouring down, and the winds begin to wail. For the rock is strong and steady, a foundation tried and true. With the solid rock beneath your feet, there's nothing you can't do. So lay your life upon the rock, where your soul will find its rest. For in the strength of Jesus, you'll always be blessed. 
No matter what may come your way No matter how high the tide With the solid rock beneath your feet You'll stand firm and abide